church family. We're so glad you're joining us today as we continue our series called Sacred Steps. Welcome to Pathway Church. I'm Jared Piney, your online pastor. And today I'm joined by your online host, Jill Harper. Yes. Welcome Pathway Church. We want to encourage you to share the service right now so others can join you to hear an impactful message. You can copy the link and text it to a friend, or if you're on Facebook, just click the share button. We love getting to know you better, and with Labor Day being on Monday, I have a question for you to answer in the chat. 
what was your first job that you ever had? Put your answer in the chat, and while you're doing that, I'm really excited. Jill, what about you? Kind of exciting, but not really. I worked at a grocery store. Oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Kind of a normal teenage job. So what about you? Yes, um, so I uh, was a lifeguard at Oswego City Pool. Nice. Yes. Well, that's fun. Yes, it was yeah. great. Didn't do a whole lot, but it was fun. So. Well, if you are new to Pathway, then let us give you a free coffee from Starbucks. Just text the word NEW to 316-444-4180, and we will send you a digital gift card that you can use on your next trip to Starbucks. Yeah, and when we say NEW, we mean that this could be your very first time watching, or maybe you've been watching the last couple weeks or even months, but our online team hasn't had a chance to meet you. We'd love to get a chance to meet you, and that starts by you texting the word NEW to the number on the screen below. So next weekend, we begin a very valuable and important series for our church called One at a Time. In this series, we will continue to equip and empower our congregation to live out walking with others in their daily lives. Yeah, and here's kind of the heart behind the series. We live in a broken world filled with people experiencing extreme hardship, but God sent Jesus to redeem us and this world. In this time on earth, Jesus brought hope and healing by walking alongside one person at a time. This is the ultimate model of how we, as Jesus followers, should carry out his mission. One conversation at a time, one relationship at a time, one prayer at a time, one act of service at a time, one person at a time, one at a time. So it's going to be a great series. Next weekend, we will kick this off with a vision weekend. It's extremely valuable for you to be a part of that special vision weekend. So make it a top priority to experience the service next weekend. We also know that before COVID, there was an epidemic of loneliness. People feeling like they have acquaintances, but not real, true friends. Those feelings of spiritual, physical, and emotional loneliness have only been amplified over the last couple of years. And that is not how God intends us to live. God wants us to have vibrant and rich relationships with others that help us grow as we help others grow as well. Yeah, we also know that exponential growth that doesn't happen from just listening to a message in rows. It comes from authentic conversations and circles through groups. If you're not part of a home team, then we would highly encourage you to attend the home team connection event during Vision Weekend. This event will be after every service at all of our campuses. At the event, you'll get a chance to meet people that are in groups and to find your tribe. Be thinking about making that decision and then go and meet some people at the connection event. You can also go to the webpage on the screen below to search for a group that fits for you. You can sign up on that webpage as well. So hear this, you are seen, you are known, and there are people for you to have authentic and rich relationships with. Find a home team and find your people. Well, as we come to our generosity moment, we are going to celebrate, Joe. You know, last weekend at all of our campuses, we saw over 60 people yes. take the step of baptism and publicly declare that Jesus has rescued them. It was amazing seeing adults, students, and kids follow Jesus through baptism. Yeah, and you had kind of a unique and a special mm -hmm. seat. You know, for one, you and your daughter were taking pictures at one of the campuses, yep. but also your son, Zeke, took the step of baptism. What was that like for you and your husband, Mason? We were just, we were proud that he made that decision on his own. And more importantly, the person that baptized him was somebody that was walking with him, has been walking with him since he was in fourth grade. And oh. so it was really special to have that person be a part. So, yeah, no, yeah. it was awesome. You'll see that's such a proud parent mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the truth. It was a powerful weekend to see God move in a mighty way. And the truth is that when you give to God through Pathway Church, then you are a part of the story too. We thank you for your generosity. It makes an eternal difference in other people's lives. The heart of our giving at Pathway is that it changes us as a Jesus follower, as well as changes the world around us with the hope of Jesus. Well, let's get ready for a message from our executive pastor, Rodney Elliott, as we continue our series called Sacred Steps. Feel free to open up the Pathway Church app, and click on the weekly guide, and then follow along with the message notes.
Well, I'm so excited to be here with all of you. What a great weekend to be together. And I want to welcome everyone who's watching at all of our locations, as well as those of you who are watching online. And I am excited to be here because of what happened last weekend. And so we are in our series, Sacred Steps, and last weekend we talked about the sacred step of baptism. And so I'm going to prepare you a little bit because I'm going to ask everyone, no matter where you're watching this, to get a little rowdy. I know it's football season and you got rowdy yesterday around something, and so this is something to really get rowdy, to get loud about, is that we watched 67 people take the step of baptism last week. Let's celebrate that. That, that was kind of rowdy for church people. We've got some work to do now. Because when you think about what God is doing, there's like a narrative in our world that like God's church is on the decline. There's Christians. Nobody's Christian anymore. It's a lie. God is moving. And that's what we can do. We can move forward in confidence knowing that God is doing something amazing right here in our midst, in our family. And so take that with you this week. Celebrate that. Don't forget that. And today what we're going to talk about is another sacred step. And this is the sacred step of communion. And just like baptism, it's a reminder of what God is doing. Now, communion has lots of different names. If you grew up in some churches, it's not known as communion. It's known as the Lord's Supper. And then there's also this really fancy name. I had a friend growing up. They didn't call it communion at their church. They called it the Eucharist. Like, I just look smarter when I say it like that, right? That's like a real fancy name for it. But whatever you call it, whatever church tradition you come from, chances are communion, it's simple. It's the breaking of bread and the drinking of the juice to remember Jesus. Now, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, my guess is like you've heard about communion. You've probably wondered what the heck is it really about? I want you to know today that there are people who have followed Jesus for years that they really don't know what it's about either. You see, a lot of times this is a tradition, but we haven't really even looked at the scriptures to see what communion is really all about. But today, we're going to do that. Now, you know, there's lots of different ways that churches take communion. There's lots of opinions, like I don't know why everybody cares, like how you do it, but we care about the how. You know, here at Pathway, we have the cup with it sealed, and I think it's really amazing, and people tell me that all the time. We take it in unison together, the bread and then the cup. Now, you may come from a church background where it even looked a little more like this. Maybe if you grew up Catholic, You know, it's like real bread. You like have to come forward and you actually all drink out of the same cup in some traditions. And so I thought we'd change it up. All right. At every campus, we're just going to pass this around today and we can all drink out of the same cup. How many of you want to do that? Man, no hands. There's one person. One person thought, man, that's what we're going to do. Now, I also know like there's different things in this cup, right? Like grape juice is what we have here, but some churches like use wine, like real wine. As my grandpa would say, it's leaded communion as opposed to unleaded. You'll get the joke later, okay? It's leaded communion. And so if you're uncomfortable, you're like, that kind of looks like wine. Like some church people are kind of stuffy. I just want to let you know this is grape juice, okay? So you can just relax. It's fine. So the church I grew up in, We did communion in our own unique way. And we were what I call, we were the pass it, two plate communion style. Some of you might have grew up this way. You got the bread in one plate and you got the little cups and the juice in the other and you had a little meditative moment and then we passed it. 
Now, if you're not familiar with this, this is a, it's an interesting journey if you've never done it that way because what you get to experience is as the bread is passed, you watch all your neighbors before you dig around in the bread and you're like, did they have their finger up their nose before they were doing that or what? They're digging around in the bread and then guess what you do? You dig around in the bread. And so all I knew is you wanted to be first. That's all you wanted to be because somebody was digging around the bread. And then when the cup was passed, this is a little weird if you like, especially with COVID kind of in the background a little bit, is when the tray with the cups, with the grape juice in it got there, you would drink it and with your slobber still kind of dangling off the cup, you would put it back in the tray next to a full, and I mean, those things almost touch. And so we were drinking each other's saliva is what really was happening. Man, communion's awesome, isn't it? Right? It's disgusting. That's what I, it's just, just disgusting. But as a kid, what I remember is from about age six, I would just beg my parents, and I'm like, I want to take communion. But we had a tradition at our church was that until you were baptized, you could not take communion. And this always frustrated me. I'm like, I I just want to take, I want to know what that bread tastes like. Because if everybody's, everybody's taking it, it must be real good, right? It must be real good. And and so I'm going to confess something today to everyone, not even my mother knows is there was, I was probably eight or nine years old, and I was in the back of our worship center, our sanctuary. I found some unguarded communion, and I took it. I took it, and it wasn't as good as I hoped. (laughs) It wasn't that impressive, but I took it, and nobody was watching, and uh, I didn't tell anybody because it was wrong. But you know what happened inside of me is I did feel guilty because I even think at a young age, I knew that communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, whatever you call it, it wasn't something to mess around with, that maybe I'd approached it and done it the wrong way. I kind of wonder if that's where a lot of us are. And so over the last few months, I've had some conversations about communion. As a pastor, anybody that has an opinion on anything, I tend to get people asking me about it, and communion is one of those things. And so it's interesting what people ask me about, and then I began knowing I was going to do this message. I started asking people, like, what's a great experience? Like, how should we do it? But what is your focus as we do communion? Now, I heard lots of things. I heard, I had one man tell me, well, here's the thing, is it's really hard to focus because the bread tastes like styrofoam. I have no idea how he knew what styrofoam tasted like. I haven't eaten a lot of it. And so if that's you, maybe you feel that way. The bread isn't tasty enough. You know, I have to tell you though, unleavened bread, if you've ever really eaten it, it's not very tasty. It's why we put yeast in everything, is that if that's you, I want you to remember that it's representative of the body of Jesus. And so my guess is taste, that might not taste good. And so when I told that man, he wasn't satisfied with that. He's like, you got to find something that tastes better. Then, you know, I have people that kind of have opinions. They're like, we want more quiet time before we take the cup and the bread. Maybe that's you. Then there's some people that are like, no, we love how we do it because it's in unison. We take the bread together and then the cup, and it's like we're all doing it together. And there was one person that said, if you could just make it wine, I would really like it. I don't know what his motive was, but anyways. So I've had dozens and dozens of these conversations, and there was one thing that was crystal clear. No one brought up Jesus one time. Seems a little weird, doesn't it? Like in, that's kind of what it's about, but what we've made it about is ourselves. Like, what does communion do for me is the American way to approach everything. But you see, communion is not about you. And man, that's a really hard thing for us because everything's about us. 
but really all I heard from people was preferences about how we do it. And that some reason there's this right way that if we just did it that way, it would be what it's supposed to be. And I want to tell you, if you think that, you're wrong. We all are wrong. I'm wrong. I've thought that before as well. And it's because we do what the Apostle Paul is going to talk to a group of people about today, and we approach communion many times in an unworthy manner. So what I want you to do is to understand how serious this is. This is not just about the bread and the juice. It's about something far more important and greater and how we approach it. This is serious stuff. And so the Apostle Paul, he wrote a letter. And it's called, in our Bibles, the book of 1 Corinthians. It's actually a letter to, to the church in Corinth. Now, the good thing about this letter, and I love the church in Corinth, and it's going to sound weird why I like them so much. I just love them. I love to read it. It's because I'm a messed up person. Anybody else in here a little messed up? Anybody messed up? Everybody, man, lots of messed up people here. You didn't raise your hand. You're processing it, but you're messed up too, okay? We're all messed up. The church in Corinth was full of messed up people. That's what, that, they were made up all messed up people. They, they couldn't even pretend they weren't messed up. So the Apostle Paul had to write these really long letters to them to try to help them. And most of the time, he was really trying to correct them. But when he comes to the, to the topic of the Lord's Supper, it's like he changes tone because it's so serious. You see, what was happening for them that's different for us than when you really would approach communion, the Lord's Supper, as the Apostle Paul is going to call it, what's different is it was a full-on meal. Now, some of you think you might like that better. It's a full-on meal, but it's got problems, and we're going to learn about that because the people in the church in Corinth, many were in poverty and were hungry, and so what the Lord's Supper became about was not about Jesus. Does that sound familiar? Like for all of us, we have our preferences about what it's like. Well, it, it didn't come about their preferences. It became about the food. It was about filling their bellies with food. And the Apostle Paul thinks this is pretty serious. And so I want to invite you, you can follow along in the Pathway Church app. You can look, follow along on the screen or you can turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11. And we're going to start with verse 20. And I want you to hear the tone of the Apostle Paul. The tone of the Apostle Paul is very different as he talks about the sacred step of communion. He says this, when you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. Could be a little bit, especially like I was as a kid. For some of you, hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. Can you imagine that? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor. What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. Exclamation point. Now, I don't know if you've ever had that with your kids where you're having a stern conversation and they're like, quit yelling at me. And I'm like, you haven't even seen me yell yet. I'm just animated. I don't think the Apostle Paul is yelling, but he's close. Man, this is serious business because they are approaching the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner is what he says. You see, what's happening is people are actually showing up to the church gathering early. Can anybody even imagine that? They are showing up early and then they don't wait for everyone to get there if they start eating the food. And then they start drinking the wine and they're getting drunk. Like it's free food and free wine for whoever comes early. And he's saying this is wrong. He 
says this is, uh, this is approaching the sacred step that Jesus himself gave you at the Last Supper to remember him. This is wrong. And this is serious. You know, for us, this should be like a sober reminder of how serious it is when we gather and we take communion together. It's not just sit there, listen to someone, pop the bread in, chase it with a little juice, right? That's not what it is. It's something more. Now, the good news is after Paul kind of yells at them a little bit, he actually gives them instructions and direction for what communion is supposed to be in our mindset as we approach it. And this is so important. So the first thing he says is the purpose of why we do this is to remember. Now you and I forget lots of things every day. But Paul is saying we do this. We celebrate communion so we don't forget and we remember the most important thing. It says this in 1 Corinthians 11. He wrote these words to them as an encouragement and an instruction. Starting with verse 23, he said, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in what? remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in what? Remembrance of me, as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. You see, Paul is saying to them, Jesus instructed us that we will forget. And so communion, the Lord's Supper, is about remember. But it's not a casual remember. Because a lot of times we tip our hat to remember. But you see, in Paul's day, there were literally people who were alive, who witnessed Jesus' crucifixion. They saw Jesus get beaten. They saw his body that was bruised and pierced, and they watched the blood flow. And so every time they would take this, Paul is saying, I want you to think about the extreme love that God has for you, that the Son of God, he left heaven and he took an extreme punishment and he was executed. Man, do we think about it in that extreme way because that's what communion is about. That's what the bread, the broken and bruised body of Jesus, it should be a little graphic in our minds. Because when we remember something that's graphic and we remember the blood that poured out of his side, that poured out of his hands, as he hung on that cross for our sins, we were stuck. And so the Son of God had to be beaten, bruised, and bleed out. Paul is saying you can't forget this. You have to remember. You have to remember Because if you forget, it becomes casual. And there's nothing casual about the Lord's Supper. Because as we remember, it produces something inside of us because we know that we're sinners. We know that we needed a Savior. And that's where this fancy word that some church traditions call communion is the Eucharist. It actually literally means thanksgiving. You see, when you see the extreme love of God, what you actually see is something that you can't explain. Do you ever sit in awe as you take communion? 
And that God would do that for you. And it produces thanksgiving in our hearts as we remember. Now, remembering is so important. And so you can actually do communion in lots of different places, not just in a church service. You can actually do it in your home team or in your family. And so our home team decided to do something a little different. We decided to do snickerdoodle communion that we kind of threw the unleavened bread thing. Doesn't that sound good? Like everybody's like, man, sign me up for that. But we did it for our kids. And so I read this scripture as we broke the snickerdoodles and we took grape juice. And see, this is the amazing thing that it produces. And I wish we all had a child's heart. Because my six-year-old Lauren comes up to me the Friday before our home team meets again. And she says, are we going to do snickerdoodle communion again? And I looked at her and I said, why? And she said, well, I like snickerdoodles. But I want to hear the story of Jesus. She wanted to remember. Did you come here today wanting to hear the story of Jesus and to celebrate the broken body and the shed blood and it produced thanksgiving? Man, that's powerful. You see, it's on a six-year-old level, and that's where most of us need it, is so that we'll remember. So the second thing that the Apostle Paul points to is to remember, but also to reflect. Now, reflection is an important part of the Lord's Supper and communion. You see, they weren't reflecting. The Corinthian church, they were running to the bread, And they were just like, we're going to scarf it down as fast as possible. There's no reflection. I eat like that most of the time. I know. No reflection. You don't even taste it really. It's as fast as it can go. But Paul points to something else. And he says this, starting with verse 27. He says, so anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now here's the really important part. That is why you should examine, reflect, examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. And that sounds kind of serious, doesn't it? It's like, Paul, why why does it have to be that serious? But see, as we approach, after we've remembered, we need to examine and reflect on our own lives. And it's not when we're like, well, we weren't that bad. No, in view of God's mercy and what Jesus did for us, we understand the weight of our sin. Our sin is what he paid for. So we're forgiven, but we confess our sins to God before we take the bread and the cup. Now here's the thing is we are lazy. Anybody in here lazy? I am, right? What we think when the Bible teaches us this is that there needs to be like a two to three minute kind of reflection time before we take communion, which we're actually going to do today, but that's not what he's talking about. Because he says before, he says before, Did you come today prepared to take communion? Did you come prepared? It's okay, because you're like, what does that mean? I was like, did you examine yourself before you came? Did you examine yourself in view of God's mercy? Like, man, I, I sinned this week. I gossiped about a coworker. I looked at pornography. I tried to not, but it kind of found me, and I found myself in a trap. You see, when we reflect and we examine, we're like, wow, in view of God's mercy, I can't believe he did that. God, I confess that to you. You see, my grandpa lived this out. My grandpa Elliot was a holy roller, which actually growing up, I didn't say that as a compliment. You probably have people in your life, you're like, man, they're holy rollers. But the thing about my grandpa is on Saturday, it was weird, and I just dismissed it growing up, is I would find him reading the scriptures Saturday morning a lot of times. 
And if you ask him what he was doing, he would say, I'm preparing myself. I'm getting ready to meet together with my brother. I'm getting ready. He was examining himself and getting ready for holy communion, as he would say. You see, for you and I, Saturdays or or Fridays, there are days. We just go to church. That's where it all happens. But no, Paul is saying when you come, reflect before you come. Confess your sin to God and to each other, and then you will be in a place where you can really remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Now, the last thing that Paul really points to is really powerful, and it's really convicting, and it's after you have remembered and you reflect, it's about reconnect. You see, reconnecting with one another and with God is core of what communion, the Lord's Supper, it's core of what it's all about. Now, if you remember the story of the Corinthian church, what were they doing? They were getting to church early as fast as they could, and they were scarfing the bread down. But there were people that were coming later that were still hungry, and it was all gone by the time they got there. And Paul was upset about this. He's like, why can't you wait for your brothers and sisters to come and to gather? And so he said this in verse 33. He said, so, my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. Wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. Wait for each other. Now you see, Paul had a specific problem he was talking about in the church in Corinth is people were coming to church early. They were eating all the communion. That is not an American church problem. We have another problem. is when we think about, are we gathered and ready to take the Lord's Supper today? There's actually some people missing. There's brothers and sisters that aren't here that are a part of our family. And don't be like, man, I'm glad I'm here today. They called that out. I'm glad. You probably were gone at some point just like I was in the past year. And so I think the Apostle Paul, he had put that exclamation point and be fired up about about this and saying, Pathway Church family, You don't think the Lord's Supper is valuable enough for you to show up for. You see, we think gathering together and remembering the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus, it's optional. You see, what we think is we're going to go to heaven, we're free, we can do whatever we want. Paul would be like, I will not praise that. Because you see, communion is not about you. Church, gathering together as a family, I hate to tell you, it's not about you. It's about that. It's about remembering what Jesus did. And you know, we have brothers and sisters who I love. Maybe this is you, but it's like, we're kind of like, we just opt out. Why is that? It's because we really aren't interested, as Paul told that church in Corinth. You see, even the word communion means this. It means the act of sharing. It's a shared experience. As we remember who Jesus is And what he's done. And it's important. And it's serious. You know Paul even says in these scriptures. That because you have approached it in an unworthy way. There are people sick and even dying. It's that serious. And so for us as we approach communion. And we're going to celebrate it here at the end. This is serious. This is life giving. You see Jesus himself established this time, and he actually foreshadowed it before the Last Supper. 
You know, Paul is referencing the Last Supper where he set up this time of communion, but Jesus actually talked about communion and the symbol that it really is. He did it one day when he stood and people were flocking to him. They were flocking to him because he had just fed thousands of people. They loved the bread. It tasted so good. Jesus, the bread that Jesus made was incredible. And so they were coming back for more bread. But Jesus said more bread and more drink in the way you're thinking about it is not what you need. He said this in John 6, 53. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I am them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Do you kind of see what this symbolizes? You know, these words actually chased people off. When Jesus told them, I'm not going to give you bread today, I'm going to give you an example of the bread that you really need and I am it, they left him. They left him. They weren't interested. They just wanted what they wanted. And so many times when we approach God, we just want what we want. We make it about us. But see, communion is a reminder of what Jesus said, that if you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, and you understand and remember the power of his sacrifice, you celebrate it until he comes again. That when we take this together, what we're reminding ourselves and the symbol is, is that his power is now on the inside. It's a reminder that we are in him and he is in us. The power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. Man, a lot of us today feel like we're powerless people. A lot of us feel like today this world's going the wrong direction, but see, communion reminds us that the power of the one who rose from the grave lives in us. As we take it in, as we take in the symbol of his broken body, as we take in the symbol of his shed blood, we remember that that power lives now on the inside. And so after we take communion together and we look at the world, we aren't powerless. We are powerful because of him. Do we live like we're powerful? You see, that's what Paul, that's why Jesus gave us this sacred time. That's why Paul talked about this sacred time. It's so serious because we forget. We forget the reality that Jesus has brought to our lives. And so today, we're going to remember, we're going to reflect, and we're going to reconnect. We've taken him in. And man, that's powerful. Let's pray together. Father, we just come to you now. God, with a new perspective of how serious what we're going to do here in a few moments, together as a church family, how serious it is as we remember the broken and bruised body of Jesus, as we remember the shed blood that he gave for the forgiveness of our sins, and they are many. God, I know that for all of us, that my guess is there's not a person that's watching this, there's not a person at any of our locations, that God, we have, not, we have approached 
this time of communion in an unworthy manner. God, just like the Corinthian church, we've made it something that it isn't supposed to be. We've made it about us. But God, today I pray that we would make it about you and you living in us. So God, today, as Paul said, we need to examine ourselves. We need to repent and ask for forgiveness for approaching this time in an unworthy manner. And so today, if that's you, and you want God's help to really right the ship of how you approach this time of communion, and you want to remember Jesus in the way that he deserves, I just want you to confess that to God right now. By raising your hand, confession is good for the soul, and it's how God changes. So raise your hand no matter where you're at right now. Confess that you need to approach this time differently. So many hands. Let me pray for all of you. Father, I know just like my brothers and sisters, God, that I confess today that I've approached the Lord's Supper communion in an unworthy manner. God, I pray that you would help us align our hearts, that we would remember, reflect, and reconnect with you and with each other. God, we pray that we would live in the reality that we have taken you in and understand that that is the power that we will leave this place as we're reminded as we take communion together. God, we're grateful that Jesus himself gave us this sacred step of communion that we can celebrate each and every week together. God, I also know today that there's many in this room and many watching this, that as they've heard this conversation, that really communion is a perfect illustration of the gospel. It's a perfect illustration and symbol of the God who loves them, the God who came and suffered and died for their sins. And I can't help but think today that they're feeling a nudge from the Holy Spirit to accept Jesus to be the leader and the Savior of their lives. And so today, if that is you, and you want to accept Jesus for the very first time, I just want to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me in the quietness of your heart. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sin and my shame and my guilt has separated me from you. But today, Jesus, I can lay those things down and grab hold of the grace and the forgiveness that you offer me through your perfect sacrifice that you made on the cross so that all my sins would be forgiven and I would be free. And today, Jesus, I choose to follow you and live the life that is truly life that is only found in you. Now, with everybody's head still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, no matter where you're at, I want you to declare that decision to God by simply raising your hand and so that I can pray for the decision that you made. Raise your hand right now if you prayed that prayer for the very first time. Raise your hand right now. Awesome. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you, God, for those who have stepped into a new relationship with you today. God, I'm grateful today that here in a few moments they will join us, that they will join us as followers of yours as we celebrate communion together. God, we're grateful that the Holy Spirit of God now lives in them and will guide them. And God, I pray that for them today as they remember and acknowledge what you've done, that God, that will change the trajectory of their lives forever. God, we're grateful that your Spirit guides each of us and we're grateful for this sacred step where we remember the power of God that lives inside of us. God, we pray all of this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. I hope you heard and listened and resonated with that message. I pray that God's word and the love of Jesus brings you peace and hope and purpose. Too many times we can go through the motions of communion and lose the real meaning, lose the real reason why Jesus instructed us to take communion. Remember from Pastor Rodney's message that the power is on the inside. The power of Jesus lives inside of us. 
Every time you take communion, remember how Jesus rescued you, reflect on God's goodness and plan for you, and reconnect with God and each other. Taking communion at our campuses is a powerful moment, but so is taking communion at home with your family or by yourself. Each and every week when you watch this service, I would encourage you to take communion at home. The bread that you take represents the broken body of Jesus so that we may have freedom. The juice represents the blood that Jesus gave so that we may find hope, peace, and forgiveness in our belief of Jesus. We created an article that you can go to that will give you directions on how to take communion, and you can find a link to it below. Go to that article during these next two songs. Remember, reflect, reconnect, and take communion. Here we go. Yeah. 
my life is yours and my hope is in you only in my heart you hold cause you made this sinner holy Your glory is so beautiful that I fall into my knees in all in the heartbeat of my life is to worship in your light because your glory is so beautiful because your glory is so beautiful Your glory is so beautiful.